this is really indeed an evening of reflection. I'd like to invite the Honorable, the Right Reverend Monsignor Vincent Blackett to give us a few remarks. And I have to say, like Harold, I only know him as Father Harcourt. Even when he called me, I think last night at 10 o'clock, I said, yes, Father Harcourt. And I always have to remember that in formal gatherings like this, he's Monsignor Vincent. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank God you didn't re remember me as Father Harry. <laughs> However, um, protocol has been, having been established, I like to just, this evening is an evening of reflection. So I just want to share some thoughts. After listening to Harun, I almost said, like the old man in Luke's gospel, Lord, you may now let your servant go in peace according to your word. So thank you very much, Harold, for your thinking, your reflection um, this evening. It all began, um, it began before 1975, really. But I'd like to thank Almighty God, that kindly light for gently and lovingly guiding me all these years amidst the encircling gloom. There's a litany of people who have stood by me and without whom the challenges of priestly ministry would have been even more difficult. Some of those persons have gone to their eternal reward. Among them, Archbishop Anthony Pantin of Port of Spain, Bishop Lester Gilly, Mother Mary Irene of the Sisters of Sorrowful Mother, Father Louis Thompson, Dominican priest, Father Edward Prime, and several other priests who worked in Barbados. And I'm happy to say, to see and to have heard Father Peter Clark, who is the only surviving member of the Dominican, English Dominican order in the Caribbean. So your presence means a lot, Father Peter Clark. And we thank you. I remember when Father Peter Clark used to move around this island on a little scooter. And I'm sure that many wouldn't uh, remember those days. So it's good to see you. Of course, I could never forget the priests and students of the Scarborough Mission who showed great kindness to me while studying there. Also, the students of Trinity College and Whitcliffe College in Toronto. I must mention Father Louis Brody, a young, radical Irish Dominican who helped us students during the revolutionary days in Trinidad. He was a biblical scholar who interpreted the Bible in light of what was happening. An article he wrote, What Color is God? caused quite a stir when it appeared in Trinidad. And I'm talking about the time of the revolution when the Black Power movement hit Trinidad and everybody was up in arms and wondering what to do. I recall, for example, some of those demonstrating throwing, throwing black paint on a white statue in San Fernando and when some people thought that was sacrilegious, I began to see that they were making a statement. And at that time, we were studying Dr. Walter Rodney, um, grounding with the brother, and Walt Rodney was the one who had questioned why is it that um, everything in heaven is white, but anything outside is black? And um, why couldn't we have a Chinese Christ, a black Christ, and so on. So that was the kind of thinking that was going on in the secular world. And people like Louis Brody helped us. Also, Father Charles Amico, Charlie, as he was affectionately known to us. Another very liberal post-Vatican priest 
who taught ecclesiology and who gave me a good sense of what it meant to be church and church in these times. I would catch up with Father Amico when I went to study in Canada sometime later. And then there was a Dutch Dominican priest, Father Carlos Spohr, another radical man who was teaching at the house, the Dominican House of Formation in Puerto Rico and who had come to us to teach moral theology. So these were the people who sought to help us to understand what was happening. These were all thinkers and they made us think. They were in the right place at the right time. And I've always said, had it not been for them, we would have seen an even greater exodus of men preparing for the priesthood. The great English theologian St. Alsem of Canterbury defined theology as faith-seeking understanding. What this definition really meant is, or was saying, is that theology is man trying to understand God. And this classical view of theology um, saw theologians as people who sat in armchairs, sitting back, reflecting, thinking. But for Paul VI, a man who is not credited for the great input that he has made in 1967, the year before I left Barbados for Trinidad to enter the Holy Ghost congregation, had issued an encyclical, Popularum Progressio. And um, comrade, I've noticed that you refer to that encyclical again and again. Um, it was like the manifesto um, of the church in those days. And I recall when we used to meet here, I had sent copies to you and to Neville Duncan. And some of the students would tell me how you all were using um, this encyclical in your classes. And of course, here in the forum that were held here in Blackrock. Out of this, um, a number of persons were thrown up on the theological scene because theology is now redefined as faith-seeking praxis. And when we hear that word praxis, we immediately think of communists, socialists, and that sort of thing. And people were seeing the theology as Marxist theology, but the person who should be credited for this was Pope Paul VI, a man, a very radical person. And we saw springing out of this, um, Hilda Camaro of Recife in Brazil, Oscar Romero, um, who was uh, martyred as he was celebrating the Eucharist. He was a very conservative bishop and who had turned radical. And, uh, from El Salvador and was recently canonized by Pope Francis, who himself was part, a product of what was happening. One of the leading theologians, leading lights of that period, and one I happened to meet and was glad that I would have met him, was John Sobrino from El Salvador. He was a member of a household of Jesuits six of whom were murdered and he escaped with his life simply because he was not around at the time when the house was ransacked and these men murdered. And John Sobrino was one of those who was pointing the church in a new direction. He spoke about the church of the poor and this is what was influencing us. Also at this time, we had what was happening in the U.S. Of a, amongst the blacks. And the, we had the various movements, civil rights movement. We have people like Martin Luther, etc. And then emerging out of this was what was known as black theology. And um, James Cone, who would be considered the father of black theology, 
was one of those persons who would have influenced me. So it is against that backdrop that I would have been educated, um, having gone through all the revolutionary stages and so on, and who was looking for a new way of doing theology. Coming back to Barbados was very challenging. But one of the good things that happened to me when I returned to Barbados is that I was assigned to this church um, as parish priest and also chaplain to the university. And so, as we heard Harold say earlier, trying to bring these three publics or to engage these three publics was my aim. And uh, well propped up by again Pope Paul VI who spoke about um, evangelizing um, the modern world and who had made the statement that the separation between culture and faith was the trauma of our times. And so it challenged me to be engaged culturally in my context here in Barbados. Many people, of course, did not understand this because here was something new happening um, in the church. But uh, whenever there's something new, uh, people would have questions to raise. And then I was gone for a while um, after working here for many years in this creative or cre uh, challenging atmosphere. I was invited to England to be visiting fellow at the Theological College of Ascension in Birmingham. And after I went for a year, and then I was asked to stay on for another year. And then I went out to Africa, to Zambia, where I was very much engaged. And there I saw the African theologians really trying to develop their own theology. And I used to envy them. And coming back to Barbados, um, I must say, again, I really felt that we had not progressed a whole heap in Barbados. And we are still lagging behind. And I hope that, as I said on my anniversary celebration, life begins at 40. So I'm beginning and I hope to re-engage um, the churches in Barbados to help them to start thinking um, creatively and acting creatively. So I just want to say um, thank you for this and to see Ralph Gonzalez here, Comrade um, Gonzalez is really an added treat to the celebration of my 40th year as a priest in the Catholic Church. So I look forward very much to seeing and listening to you, Rob. Thank you. I just want to say congratulations to my brother. 40 really brilliant years. I have known him as a friend for 39 of those 40 years. And he would always encourage me to write folk songs. I, I would always say, well, you know, I don't see the difference between any kind of music, just eight notes juggle, jazz, blues, rock, reggae, calypso, folk, whatever. And he would say, yes, but the folk songs will last longer. And then one day he said to me, oh, by the way, I haven't heard you any songs in praise of the Creator. And I, I said, well, I have some. I said, but you ain't sing them yet. But at least you know the words to, to uh, the Our Father. I said, Our Father, what's that? I said, oh, you call it the Lord's Prayer, but we call it the Our Father. And by the way, don't let me expose you because you know you're a Catholic, you, you are a Christian at the Catholic Church. <laughs> and I said, okay. I know that one. And anytime that we meet in a setting, 
anything to do with the church or any meeting, I want you to sing that song and the other song, which I wouldn't call the name yet. But they said it'll come on this time and it'll come on another time. And I, I want to, to quote Harold Hart. This is a man of deity and dignity. Thank you. Our Father. Thy kingdom 